Greetings, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome once again to SJN TV Presents Men on a Mission. Hi, I'm your host, Bob Zeke, and today we have a really special treat. Many of you have probably been wondering about uh, some of the uh, personalities involved with uh, making these broadcasts possible. We're affiliated with St. Joseph Radio, and some of our hosts work both the TV side and the radio side. So today I thought it would be appropriate for you to get to meet one of those voices who maybe you hear but haven't seen and maybe seen and would like to know something more about. So stay tuned. We'll be right back and I'll introduce you to my guest today. Hey, welcome back to the program. Bob Zeke here. Let me introduce for you today my special guest, Mr. Peter Karutz. Peter, how does it feel to be on the other side of the equation? I'm on the other side of the table. Good to be here with you. Well, I thought it'd be appropriate that uh, people have been uh, tuning into this network, either via radio or television, to maybe get some of the background on some of the personalities involved to making this mission possible. So. Uh, I decided to pick on you today and let you more or less tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about you and how you got from your beginnings to being involved in evangelization and working on radio and TV. So be, be, to set the table, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background yeah. and uh, your formation, your early years in, in your faith journey. Yeah, it, it you know, it's crazy, right? If anybody is going to wait until they're ready to try and be an evangelist or evangelize, you'll never do it. So, <laughs> but anyway, I am, um, I'm the product of um, immigrants. So I am first generation in this country. Is that right? I didn't yeah. know that. My, uh, my real name is not Peter, actually, because my first name is too hard to pronounce. <laughs> and, my, and, and it's actually not on the birth certificate. So I, I was born Oscar Peter Karutz, Jr., in Chicago, Illinois, in Columbus Hospital in 1961. Unfortunately, my poor immigrant parents didn't realize that you couldn't call someone a junior unless that is the father's name. So okay. my, my grandfather was Oscar. So what country did they migrate from? Yeah, so my, uh, my mother came from Mexico, and her gra grandparents came from Spain. So we're really bad Mexicans. And my father came from Germany right after World War II, so he was really loved too. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, my, my, my birth certificate has Oscar crossed out. Okay. And it's typed in Ulrich. So I went with Peter <laughs> for good reason. Okay. For good reason. So we're, we're very bad Mexicans. My, my Mexican family is actually taller and blonder than my German family. Uh, and then oh, we did Castile the, Spaniards, huh? Yeah, we're northern Spain. So it's uh, the Pyrenees uh, okay. and um, kind of the Basque country. So we're tall and... Uh, green-eyed and very odd. I uh, gotcha. Anyway, so, so I grew up in Chicago, and um, my parents were divorced uh, uh, at an early age, and uh, I really didn't see my father for about 25 years. Wow. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a, one of those classic stories. If you, if you really want to ensure poverty, make sure that there is no father in the house. Mm. My mother didn't uh, graduate from high school, but she had a great business mind. She's the best negotiator I have ever met, and I follow her example all the time. Uh, but she, um, we, we converted her house. We had a house, and uh, we uh, had no way of making a living. Uh, I remember early on, they cut off the phone and then the gas mm. uh, in Chicago, and then the electricity, and we're losing the house. And, you know, my mother had to figure out what, what are we going to do? So we, uh, we rented three bedrooms upstairs individually. We got a handyman who, who put a wall up in our living room. And we lived in the living room. My brother and I shared a bed. My mom slept on the floor. Mm -hmm. And in the back room, my mother took care of children. And we made our living that way. Wow. And, um, and, and got through it. Uh, so how did you, who imparted the faith on you then? Oh, my mother had great faith. I mean, she really did, and, and did to the end of her life. Um, I mean, to skip to the end, in her old age, she, she used to do pilgrimages around the house, if you will, just going to the various images of Our Lady and praying for us all the time. 
but she had she had great faith. So yeah, she had the big influence on you and and yeah. your faith formation. No and doubt. Everything. Yeah, yeah. I uh, um, I as a boy, I wanted to be a priest. And there's evidence. My brother found pictures that he shared with the whole family of <laughs> me saying mass in my underwear, of all things. <laughs> and, uh, and I went to a minor seminary in high school. So I went away for high school as opposed to college. Okay. So I went away for four years in high school and um, I guess discerned slowly that uh, that's not what God wanted of me. And then I came back and went to Loyola University and... Um, I'm trying to think, what am I going to do with my life? You know, we, we, we don't have money yeah. uh, at all. And I remember one time I had been accepted to Loyola. Even back then it wasn't the, an inexpensive place to go to. And I, uh, uh, I found my mom in this back room just sitting in a corner crying. And, you know, you know, didn't know what was wrong. She was a strong woman, you know. And she, she had always imparted us that we had to be educated. We had to go to college. You know, we, we, we lived in a poor neighborhood. There's gangs everywhere. I mean, we, she really kept us on the right path. And she said, I have no idea how we're going to pay for college. And, um, and of course, we did, right? So I worked full time. I went to school full time. And I had to figure out what I was going to do to, to get through this. So... I found out that you're considered a professional if you get a degree in business and accounting and pass your CPA exam, and then I was going to go to law school. So uh, I, uh, that's what I did. Uh, and I took my CPA exam while I was still in college, Wow! and I passed. I worked at a bank for five years, four years in college, and then out. And, um, and I uh, took the LSTAT and started applying to law schools. Uh, while I was working at my current job, I'm a forensic accountant, I'm a boring accountant, <laughs> and uh, I realized that as I was working with lawyers that I, I don't want to be one of those. <laughs> and all my friends had jobs, and they hated their work. They, they hated what they were doing, and I was really loving what I was doing. So I thought, what am I doing? Why, why am I going to leave this career? So sure. I, uh, I, I did fairly well. I, at four years, they asked me to move to St. Louis. Actually, they asked me to move to California, and I didn't. Um, you know, when, when, my, when I graduated, uh, I thought, my mom needs a break. I mean, literally, she worked day and night, day and night. So I said, you're on, you're on hiatus. So I took over the house at, at 21 years old, and I took care of the bills, and I took care of my brother who was in college. My mom took a couple of months off, a year. I couldn't, I couldn't leave and go to California. Right. Um, so I turned it down. And then they asked me to move to St. Louis. I opened an office here, and um, I'm a forensic accountant. Wow. Boring accountant. They're ready to throw me out. <laughs> yeah, but I've never seen a happier one. Uh, <laughs> of course, I think the Lord might have something to do with that. Yeah. So yeah. you come to St. Louis. Uh, you had uh, confessed to me before we uh, started the cameras rolling, that in your whole life you've never missed Mass, save for what we've recently gone through on the COVID thing. Yeah. So you've been a faithful, faithful man of God and, uh, uh, you know, on your journey, as we all are. So after you come to St. Louis, tell us a little bit more on, on your faith journey and on how you actually got to this point in your life. Yeah. Well, and, and let me just confess. Now, I, I've gone to Mass. I don't miss it. I mean, there was a... But I, you know, what does God do right straight with crooked lines? Let me tell you, I, 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 uh, I was not the model citizen as a, <laughs> as a young man. And I, I remember uh, before I left Chicago, I dated this girl for about three years, and um, she, she dumped me in front of the family on Christmas Eve. Oh, my gosh. And I thought, that's it. I, I, good guys finish last. I came up with my rules for life. I'm, you know, I, I, I was going to be a, a, a rotten guy. I mean, I had resolved to, you know. Definitely broke your heart, huh? I was mad, to be honest. But what's ironic about that is I started going to Mass every day. 
And what motivated you? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I, what did I do? I resolved to be a, 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 a bad man, right? And you end up going to mass as and a I result. And I end up going to mass every <laughs> single day. So um, I, I don't know. God has a, you know, I often say, I think God's after us. Right? The hound of heaven, he's after us. Nobody motivated you, just, it just came to you? Or what, what was the motivation to steer in that direction following something uh, that can be very traumatic? I, I, it, just, I it just something came in your heart and you said, I need to go to Mass in the morning. I have no idea. You know, people say, you know, I, I was wandering this bad path and then I found God and then I got, grew in my faith and then I realized I wasn't alone when I was wandering around. God right. was in my life and right. I think that's what it is. So I started going to St. Peter's, which is in the middle of downtown Chicago uh, at noontime. And we moved our offices a little bit further west in the loop and there was this old, old parish, uh, St. Patrick's, which is the oldest parish in Chicago. And it was literally falling down. Bricks would fall out and hit people on the head. And, and I started going to Mass there, and I went there every day. Um, and uh, why? God's after you, you know? God's after you. So, uh, I, um, even in my uh, resolution to be a very bad man, I, God was after me. And so what happened from all that experience then? I don't know. Did the, the anger and everything just slowly melt away? Yeah, uh, Were you able did. to, you replace the, the put in your heart uh, more room for the Lord as a result of all this? How would you describe that? I think God has a path for us. You know, I, I remember when, when I got dumped, I thought, well, I, I don't understand this. And I called her after 30 days and I said, you know, can we get, you know, let's, let's have dinner. We had a great conversation. She said, I would like to do that. I'd like to have dinner. And she says, but we don't have a future. And I resolved at that point that I gave up from that point on. I said, this is, this is not my path, right? Um, so I, I think sometimes we have to realize that we don't know all the answers, right? Right, and we right. just kind of put it in God's hands. Anyway, so I moved to St. Louis mm, shortly after that. It wasn't because of so that. So you're but single, it, and you moved to St. Louis. I moved to St. Louis, but before I moved to St. Louis, I went to a wedding of my best friend, and uh, I was the getaway driver. Uh, we uh, were boyhood uh, friends from 13, 14 years old, and I turned around at mass. And I look at this girl in the second row, and I thought, this is the most beautiful girl I have ever seen. And I, and I asked the bride, I said, you know, you know, as I say, I said, you're beautiful, the wedding was beautiful, all this beautiful stuff. Who is this woman? And she says, I just came up to her and said, who is this woman? Turns out it's her first cousin. I knew my wife's uncle before I knew my wife. Really? So we, we got together at that uh, reception, uh, and, you know, I've, we've been dating ever since. And anyway, after the reception, what's funny is my, my wife's uncle is calling her dad talking about me and saying, hey, you know, I think there's a good guy. So long and short, we, uh, a long uh, courtship, almost five years. I was already bound for St. Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, and she moved a year later. And she had her own place, right? I had my own place. And I think I asked to get married couple of times. The last time there was a big restaurant and the glass was engraved and the ring was there and everybody in the restaurant knew. And, and before then I had gone to Chicago and showed the ring to my mom and my colleagues. And in the restaurant, everybody knows, and it was not right now. Wow. So we put the ring away and, uh, and we carried on. So the, the point is, I, I, I knew this is what God wanted of me at that particular time. And I remember resolving that in another year, if the answer is no, I would count these five years as a blessing. And I was committed and, um, and didn't know what was going to happen. But I think that's what marriage has to be based sure. on. Absolute, right. total commitment. F and friendship first. And friendship first. And we had a great friendship. <clears throat> That's so important that uh, that ground, that foundation is laid. That's the uh, firm foundation of the relationship to yeah. make sure that you are friends first and foremost, best friends, yeah. and you know you just complement each other yeah. so well that way. And and you know, w as we go through our lives, you know, we, I think the Holy Spirit talks to us all the time, and usually our answer is no, <laughs> and. 
and I, I remember years ago, uh, and it happens all the time, it happens to you, it happens sure. to me. You are compelled, you feel compelled to do something, to say something, to go somewhere. And you think, that doesn't make sense. That's, that, that, that's dumb. That's embarrassing. Yeah, where's that coming from? Yeah, and, and at, at the moment, I decide, or we decide, I'm not going to do it. And I have regrets. So I remember one time I said, I'm not going to do that anymore. If I feel compelled, I'm going to do it. And I'm telling you, it, it was an incredible blessing. I remember I went to my pastor one day, Father Valls, and my wife was there and my children, and we're just, he's just greeting people after Mass. And I went up to him and I said, Father, your spirit is troubled, and I want to pray for you. And he stopped what he was doing, and he walked away, and he says, my father is, is very ill. Would you pray for him? Wow. And, 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 I, and God has rewarded me, or maybe influenced me, to, to continue to do that. I was in, at Mass, and I have a tradition of always saying hello to somebody at Mass who I don't know. And we were at a different church. My daughter and I, we were going on a trip, so we, we went to wherever we went, and there's this old lady behind me. And uh, I turned around after Mass, and I said, it was really nice sharing Mass with you today. And my daughter, Carol, and she said, why, why do you do these things? It's so embarrassing. She doesn't know who you are. You're creeping her out. And we're walking out as my daughter is, you know, berating me. And I feel a tug. And this yeah. lady stops me. And she says, thank you for saying hello to me. Yeah. She says, today would have been my 50th wedding anniversary. Oh, my goodness. And I lost my husband last year. And I miss him so much. So, oh, wow. Thank you. When you're... When the Holy Spirit is tugging on your shirt, right, right. tapping you on the shoulder, right. say yes, you'll never regret it. Right. You just never, never will regret it. What did that cost you, too? Cost you nothing. Cost me nothing. Just, just the pleasantries of expressing yeah. a love moment, uh, which you felt that anyway. Yeah. My goodness, you just received the Blessed Sacrament, so yeah. you know, you're getting ready to walk out of there with, with Jesus in you and everything. And, what an incredible thing in the moment of a life of an individual. Yeah. And I think we need to grow as, as individuals, too. We need yeah. to stretch and do right. things that are uncomfortable sometimes. Right. You know, I, and we think about our prayer life. You know, we, my wife and I started doing an hour of adoration in 2011, and we made that commitment. And I remember one day, my daughter was in second grade, and um, uh, so my adoration would start right after 12 o'clock Mass. So I would go in at 1 and... And my children would come in and spend a minute with me, or two or three or five or ten mm -hmm. or whatever. So one day, my youngest daughter comes in and s sitting with me for a few minutes. And she says to me, uh, would you like to say the rosary? I'm like, yes, yes, I would. And honestly, I, the rosary was not uh, part of my discipline. It wasn't part of my prayer life. So my daughter and I said the rosary. And... Uh, in all honesty, I've said it every day since. She's 21 years old. So what, what brought me to a, a greater faith life, prayer life? My daughter did. Right. I think our children can and right. do. Yeah. Anybody can have an influence on us yeah. <clears throat> in a spiritual life. That uh, and God sends special messengers all the time if we're uh, if our radar's up and we're willing to uh, be open to the message that's trying to be conveyed. Yeah. Because God loves us so much. He, he doesn't want us to feel alone and alienated. Uh, he wants to share himself yeah. and make you aware of that his presence, that I'm around. Right. So, but we got to say yes. Well, yeah. It, We've got that <clears throat> pesky free will. We can say no at any time. It's our free will. Yeah. So, you, you know, I'm, I'm looking at myself here, and I'm, I'm an accountant. Uh, what, what in the world, and you too, I mean, what are we doing here, right. doing radio and TV? Right. Uh, I, I, again, I, I, part of that other realization, I traveled a great deal. I do travel a great deal. I work a lot. And uh, I used to say, I can't commit to anything. I can't commit to being on a baseball team or a golf league. Because I, I will always disappoint, right? I can't follow through 100% of the time. And... Uh, 
at one point in time, I thought, you know what? Maybe that's my life. And, and if I don't start doing things, I will never do anything. Right. So when I moved to St. Louis, I uh, started teaching confirmation. So I taught confirmation class for 12 years. And um, then I joined other boards and whatnot. And, and one, I went to one Started of the, to give of yourself more. Yeah, right. And I, I, I went to the first Catholic Men for Christ conference and talked to a couple of buddies and he said, why don't you come on the planning board? So I did that, you know, and did I make every meeting? No, I didn't make every meeting. Um, but I, I remember, I forget how many years ago it was, we're at this planning committee meeting and it's not on a regular day. It's at the, uh, the Regali Center, but we didn't, have our regular room because it wasn't the regular day and we weren't on the first floor we were in the basement in the back <laughs> and we're in the middle of this meeting and this young man comes in his name's Josh Dieters and he he's kind of sheepishly says I don't want to interrupt you guys but I, I just wanted to thank you uh, and we're like, okay he says, I want to thank you for putting on this conference he says La last year my father dragged me, kicking and screaming to this. And as a result, I came back to the faith. He says, I'm an RCIA. I'm like, really? So well, that was great. You know, so he pops out. And uh, we all are volunteers. So uh, Joe Bastian gives us all jobs for the next week or month. And he says, Peter, go find this kid and, and, and interview him or talk to him or write an article or do something, right? So I don't know who he is. I don't know how we found him. I found him. And I talked to a buddy of mine, Steve Dickett, and I said, this is what I'm told to do. He says, well, you know, there's this place out in St. Charles, and Luke Cortese, she'll let you do a, a video or a radio or something. She's got all this stuff. So that's what we did. And we did a three-minute and an eight-minute or a 12-minute interview, just like we're doing here uh, right. up on the green screen, and it looked incredibly <clears throat> right. professional. Excuse me. And we, and we talked, and Lou said, oh, I want you to do this, I want you to do that. And, and I thought, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. You're right. I'm an accountant, for goodness right. sakes, uh, but thank you for helping, <laughs> helping us out here. Sure. And the next thing I know, I'm a guest on the radio, I'm doing uh, the Lenten Speaker Series, we're doing videos, and, and um, um, involved in other things Catholic. And it's really been a, a, a great blessing in my life. Did, and I have to say this from my perspective, and I'm sure it is for you too, uh, you probably had no preconceived <laughs> ideas or aspirations or whatever to get into the media business. Zero. Right. Absolutely no previous, zero. Uh, I don't know if you took speech in uh, college or whatever. I know no. I didn't. No. Uh, maybe for me, you're, you're a bean counter by trade. That's right. I was uh, Boring bean counter. It's right. part of the profession. That's right. And I was uh, in the barge business and yeah. uh, worked for a couple of grand companies and, right. in sales and logistics and all that. And here we are, and giving I told, ourselves over to the Lord. I told my wife, she said, well, how long are you going to do this? I said, it's... I don't know, not very long, because I would meet, we would meet all these other people who right. came in who were so good and so right. professional. I said, I'm confident I'll be fired momentarily, you know, and, and the speaker series. I said, there's a senator, two bishops, and a priest, and me. I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> you know, I'm out. And yeah, one actually, of these things doesn't belong here. One right. of these things doesn't belong. Right. But you know what? I, I'm not here because I've, I've looked for it. I, you're the same way. Right. I think God has decided that we should be here, and the day that we're not supposed to be here, we won't. That's the way I look at it. I mean, uh, this is such an incredible opportunity to witness to our faith and to uh, stand up and be counted. But I don't do it for any vainglory, and I'm sure you don't either. Uh, it's all for the greater honor and glory of God and for souls. And I, I couldn't help but think when you mentioned the young man when you were there, and he was thanking you for the conference. I've said many times what I do in studio, if I only touch one soul, all the effort was completely worth it. And I'm sure it made me think of that young man. He was affirmation to you guys for all those planning meetings, all those things that you did. If it had an impact on just one individual's life to introduce him and to bring it back to the Father, that was it. That was payment. Yeah. 
And most of these things we do, I mean, what did Mother Teresa say? You're not called to be successful, you're called to be faithful. Right. Most of the things we do, we don't know what the impact is on right. the world. You know, someone asked me once, what's the difference between the particular judgment when we die and the general judgment? I mean, you're already judged, you're already in heaven, it's already decided, right? right. And I heard someone say, and I repeated it, that perhaps at the general judgment, you become aware of all the good that you did and what impact it had. Right. You know, a couple of years ago, I remember being at another Catholic for Men for Christ conference planning session. And I said to the, our liaison for the Archdiocese, I said, I wonder whatever happened to that kid, Josh Dieters. And she looked at me and she said, you don't know? I said, no. He says, he's in the seminary. <laughs> I, I was with, wondering if you're going to say that. I met with him last week. He's at Immaculate Heart in New Melly, and he's just a brilliant young man. Wow. Absolutely brilliant So he's a seminarian man. right he's now? He's a seminarian a year or two from being a transitionary deacon, but okay. brilliant guy. Look him up on YouTube, Josh Dieters, and you'll, you'll find him. You'll find that first interview. Oh, he's, okay. So has he done some other things too, though? Not or? a thing. Since then, since you interviewed him, that's been... I, I just found him okay. again. And, and so what, actually what he's going to do is he's going to coordinate with the seminarians. And on the radio, we're going to have a seminarian once a month in, uh, going forward. And he is going to coordinate On St. Joseph Radio. On St. Joseph Radio. Saturday at noon. Don't miss it. Yeah. I'd love to uh, get him in here and put him before this side of the the uh, media Look, aspect. Once he comes in, we're not letting him go. <laughs> okay. We're not letting All him right. go. All right. Well, listen, it, why don't you share for the viewers uh, what this has meant to you with your relationship and uh, how it's enhanced your faith to give of yourself, to surrender some of your time, and, and was it, has it all been worth it? Yeah. Why well, don't you tell them no, what you No know. doubt. You know, I have a great friend. Uh, his name is Monsignor Gaelic. He's, he was my first spiritual director at 13. He's still my great friend. I just missed a call from him. And I remember him telling us a story about when he was in the major seminary. And the, uh, I think it was the Spanish teacher got ill. And they said, Gaelic, you're going to teach this class. Oh. And what he had to do is he had to study a chapter or two ahead. Look, what this has done for me is it caused me to dive into my faith. I have read more, studied more, been in touch with so many priests. Why? Because I, I gotta, gotta get ahead, right? I gotta get that next bit. Today, Father Huber and I did Christology. I know what that is, but there's so much of it. If I right. read from the right. time I'm right now until I'm 100, I will never read everything I want to read. That's true. So this, is, this has been an encouragement to, to dive deeper into the faith from, a, as John Paul said, with both wings, right? Right. With faith. And the bottom line is you'll never outdo God in generosity. No. So what you give, uh, he gives us back a hundredfold. Absolutely. And in the end, uh, uh, happy, joyous, peaceful. Your life has just been made more whole, really and truly more so the man that God created you to be and, and has meant us to be as individuals. I know I feel that same way too. Uh, and it's important. You know, our faith is meant to not be uh, withdrawn and, and kind of hidden away. It's made to be shared. Put it it's on a, put a light the on the... good news, right? That's right. This young man I interviewed last week has given a few years to an organization called Focus, and uh, he, he, which is, they're missionaries to university students. Right. But the one thing I got out of it, and I think it's a, it's a lesson to me, it's a lesson to everybody, he had serious doubts I mean, even to the existence of God, right? He was not perfected, but he was pursuing what he thought God was asking him to do. Let's not wait until we have figured everything out, that we have learned everything there is to learn, that we are as holy as we should be before we take the step to share the good news. God will work with us. That's true. God will give us the grace and everything we need if we are generous in spirit, and just say, and just let go and let God. There you as go. As Padre Pio used to love to say. And you can never, again, you can never outdo God in generosity. He gives us what we need when we need it. Well, Peter, we're about running out of time. 
I'm so glad that we had this opportunity for you to come in and share to our viewers and our listeners a little bit about you. So now when they see you or hear you on the radio, they're going to, I remember listening or watching that guy. <laughs> yeah, he's so, got a face that should stay on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for being our guest. Thank you. It was good to be on this side of the table. I want you were a joy. On behalf of everyone here with SJEN TV and St. Joseph Radio, I want to thank you for being uh, our guest at home and I ask you to pray for us in our ministry and all the things that we're doing. Know that we're praying for you and we wish you God's blessings and peace. Until we see you again, God bless.